My name is Daniel Schweiger. I'm the soundtrack editor of FilmMusicMag.com, and uh, thank you for coming to the uh, Logan Q&A and uh, CD premiere event. I'd like to introduce on the uh, far left hand, our Mr. Marco Beltrami. Hello. Uh, next to Marco, Buck Sanders. Hello. Marcus Trump. No relations. <laughs> it's very, very sad. So sad. And uh, Brandon Roberts. Well, I mean, I, you know, what can you say about Logan? It's really a, a superhero film and score unlike any other. Uh, very bleak, depressing, powerful, uh, and a wonderfully sad ending. Uh, big hit critics absolutely love this in the way they haven't shown love to many superhero films of late. And again, the score is such such a powerful component of that. You know, it's really it harkens back from everything to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to the Taking of Pelham One Two Three, uh, and just how incredibly diverse that this is. And what I did is I you know I kind of brought some clips to preamble about how how we got to Logan the, the scores among the dozens uh, that you've done Marco that kind of show the roots of this and uh, Zach Toe put together some pretty cool clips here I'd like to show that kind of uh, go through both the the Western elements and some of the superhero elements that would end up in Logan um, and I'd like to start off with uh, three clips. Uh, our first clip is from 310 Team, and I believe that was your first film with uh, director James Mangold. And, That's correct. And an Oscar-nominated score. So, Marco, tell me about what, what clicked with you and James, even though, you know, the, the score itself definitely played homage to Spaghetti Westerns and Marconi. It, it had a very different, very typical, very harsh, angry sound uh, that, again, I really distinguish it from your, your kind of typical Western revisionist score. Uh, well, the thing that, um, the thing about uh, Morricone that I've always been a fan of is, um, his uh, taking things that may appear in one context and using them in another, like for instance, um, sounds that, well, to an extreme example, sounds that might not even be musical in nature and making musical things out of them. I think it's, it's sort of the whole, um, in, um, in the 60s and 70s, there was a real push for um, pushing the limits of instruments and extended techniques and all that stuff uh, because you know harmony had already been explored and all this stuff and um, these it was trends that were happening in just in music in general and I think what Morricone did was he did this with um, instruments and um, in this in this particular scene um, like for instance the, the rhythmical elements come from uh, using, we had a, an organ, uh, like a pump organ, and using just the pedals and uh, using the, the rhythm of the pedals as being a, a, a rhythm in it, as well as uh, jaw harp and um, even a, a, a um, the, the chimes on a clock. So there are things that might not be normal scoring elements, like you wouldn't use you know, they're instruments that aren't used in, in uh, a normal fashion. And I think those, that idea of working with, with sound is something that uh, stems back to uh, my interest in Morricone. Very cool. I don't know if you gentlemen worked on this particular score. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, you, you orchestrated on it. Yeah. And, um, the uh, I, I just the main thing I remember about this film is we, we were so excited to do a western because this was 
you know, there have been so many horror films before this, and uh, Mark and I are big uh, Western fans. So at the same time, we were working on Die Hard 4, yeah. and that was a very sort of difficult uh, project. But uh, we, uh, we would split up the day. Like, half of it would be Die Hard. Then we were so excited to jump. You know, the second half of the day would be about Yuma and just, you know, a lot of the sounds we just made in this teeny little bungalow studio that we had. You know, it's just Mark and I, uh, you know, messing around with instruments and, uh, you know, processing them. And, uh, We're excited because, well, first of all, I think every every movie that I do is a Western. So um, no, no matter what the genre, and what, <laughs> I approach it like that. So to actually have a real Western to do is exciting. So I think, you know, another thing that really, for me, distinguished Logan is this kind of emptiness and beauty of, of these very tortured characters. And again, to reach back to that, you have a very excellent film that Tommy uh, Lee Jones directed called uh, The Homesman, and a very beautiful, spare, unusual score about uh, this grizzled uh, cowboy hauling these mentally unstable women across the West. And again, music that really just conveys this haunted, this beautiful landscape. And this is a, a scene that really features the score, you know, almost solely. It's really a gift to get a scene like that, where it just the music is conveying so much about it, it, characters who really don't talk very much. And again, you really kind of pushed your whole idea of sound with this, but also there's a beautiful kind of hymnal, melodic quality about this that really conveys these characters. Oh, well, thanks. Um, it's the same organ. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Is this a what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> and you actually, I believe you have like a tuned piano out, out like in, in Malibu where you oh, work. Yeah, and yeah, this, yeah. I mean, we had a lot of fun on the score. Uh, we had, yeah, like Marcus just said, we recorded, um, we just fin finished building this beautiful studio. Uh, everything sounds great in it. And we decided that we record the orchestra outside. Um, so that the sound wouldn't have any warm surfaces to vibrate off, it would just sort of dissipate. And um, Buck created a lot of the sounds. That sound you hear in the beginning um, is a guitar that he built called a harmonic guitar, um, which, well, he'd be better explaining it, but um, it, it has that, that the beginning of the cue. I don't know if you picked it out uh, before they go in the water. Um, and, I think it's the same spirit of um, innovation and curiosity that um, spurs both these directors, both Tommy and, uh, and Jim. Jim very much encouraged us in our early meetings to not worry about the picture and to just write ideas. Um, and. You know, I was getting nervous because we had this movie. We had like eight weeks, and you know, we're spending four of them just dicking around writing things. And you know, at our first session, we had a session. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it, 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 what I'm trying to say is that there, um, I, I, it's that same, it's that same spirit that um, characterizes, I think, uh, the projects that I most enjoy. And, and that is, you're not trying to copy the attempt. You're not trying to um, uh, follow any conventions, really, but just you know, sort of follow your heart and what you want to do. Uh, with, it's interesting that you picked these two directors because um, I think uh, the reason Marco got Yuma was because they basically jumped the whole thing with uh, three burials of Milky Adis Estrada, which was Tommy's film before Homesman, and uh, and you know he it, it works so well. J J Mangold's really great at placing music and uh, you know putting a feel that you might not expect to put in a scene. And uh, so you know I, I think he responded to Tommy Lee's uh, you know desire to you know explore sounds and you know sort of be free against. Uh, what a traditional approach, you know, a current day approach might be. 
so uh, you know that, that there's a strong link between those two guys when it comes to that. So Marcus, actually, please tell me how you came into uh, Marcos' orbit. Um, I I started orchestrating for with uh, on, on Hellboy. And that was the first. Um, so I don't know uh, how long. We had a, a there was a, an orchestrator that used to work with me a lot. Starting out back with Scream, his name was Bill Boston, and um, he he doesn't live in LA anymore. But um, he kept telling me, "Oh, you got to check out um, my friend Marcus, who they went to school together." Um, did you go to school together? No. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, actually, no. I've, I've, we worked on a on a Halloween eight t together <laughs> as an orchestra <laughs> for Danny Lux. That was, uh, uh, yeah, that was okay. an obscure sort of movie. And but yeah, he he mentioned you a lot and said you know um, you should meet him. Um, and yeah, I think yeah. That, I don't know. It was after it was after Terminator, I think. But yeah, it was right after Terminator. I think yeah. that's when I finally met. And then I first I had him orchestrate a few things and. Um, it was everyone was really impressed. Um, the guy that I normally use, his name is Pete Anthony. Up until that time, you know, he was very protective of his own gig. He couldn't help but comment on how much he liked Marcus's work. And then, so you know, soon thereafter, I realized his talents. And just instead of having Marcus, I just had him write the scores. I, I think the first thing that I wrote on was was uh, um, was the cursed. Kurt, remember was that, that was the, the yeah, yeah yeah so that was like a Wes Craven right it went through the mill Underworld was after that it was after that yeah and then we actually co-scored a movie a French movie oh yeah uh, Messerine yeah. Yeah. yeah great movie yeah how about you Brandon so I'm Marcus too <laughs> <laughs> so once Marcus got too busy um, uh, then I don't know right about the time Marcus started scoring this TV show called V like the remake of I love the remake of V. What happened? Yeah, so, right. <laughs> <laughs> where it ends is it makes it the most depressing oh show in history. Yeah. It ends with the destruction of the world. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no resolution. You know, but uh, basically, um, uh, Marcus Marcus jumped on it for a little bit. Then Marcus got promoted. Then then Marcus left a vacancy, and Marcus and I actually went to school together. We've been yeah. friends forever. So. He said, I know this guy, he doesn't, he, 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 you know, he can help out, at least with TV, because I was working with, uh, on Battlestar Galactic and stuff before that. So he kind of, kind of, I just kind of took his spot and then it all, it all kind of worked out. So I've been on since, since then, basically. And I think the first thing, first film I did with you guys was Scream 4. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. Before Woman in Black? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so this is basically so. our, our, Stable. It's like every project, you know, it's the, the four of us, some semblance of the four of us, you know, we, whoever's doing other things, whatever, but uh, it's um, We're like a family. Yeah. Very cool family. We don't <laughs> use his last name, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. If you want to get a team in the Midwest somewhere. <laughs> it's very sad, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So now we get into the Marvel Universe, and uh, I believe the Wolverine is actually your first Marvel score. Um, and it's a very, very uh, same character, very different film, uh, same, same character, same dir director, very different film, and fairly different score uh, from what Logan's going to end up being. But again, uh, this is a great example of you know, hard-ass superhero scoring. I mean, what I personally love about that, this, the scoring of that scene, is not only it's playing the, this tension and this race against time, but it's also really playing the emotion of her trying to save her friend. And again, it shows the kind of the difference between more of a kind of dissonant experimental scoring and then going to maybe more typical superhero scoring in the second half of that sequence. Yeah, there's actually a, a scene that, that Brandon worked on, and um, the. Uh, I remember, I mean, I can tell from my point of view what was going on, and then Brandon can speak a little bit about it too, but um, the, um, I remember exactly those things that you're talking about were a difficult thing to achieve. We, there was, and um, we had a similar situation on a movie that we had done just previous to this called World War Z, where there's these 
zombies taking over an airplane, and there's a sustained tension. We had to do it. Um, and so we were working, Buck had created these shepherd tones, which were like uh, rising tones that keep going. They, you know, um, they sort of loop around, and there's no beginning or end to them. And um, that was sort of the starting point, but uh, I think, right? For, yeah. And then, but then, yeah, I mean, what, what are you talking about, Brian? Um, it's a really long scene, right? So um, the idea was to divide it into two major chunks. And, um, and actually, I remember when Marcus first met Buck, that Buck only talks about shepherd tones, and, <laughs> and that's just this, that's just a, a slowly, like Margaret said, it's just like a slowly rising sound. And um, and then I met Buck, and he's just like, oh, you know, shepherd tones. <laughs> so uh, so I was like, all right, let's check this out. So we tried it on World War Z on a couple of things, but then on this, it was like, surely you can't get through three minutes of footage with one long sound. I mean, obviously there's stuff underneath it, but you can't. So um, we tried we tried that, and then totally coincidentally, Mangle, uh, the director, was really into was it Ligeti at the time? Yes. He got really into like dissonant um, dissonant orchestral sounds. So we tried tried that concept with orchestral sounds, and that gets you through to the point where she gets whacked in the face, and or I, when she loses her sword. And then the second half of the cue is basically when, um, like you, you mentioned, when it gets into more traditional action stuff. But even that is still based on a slowly rising shepherd tone, but we just changed the, the arrangement of it. So now it's so, but it's all rising. So um, it was kind, of, and we had no idea what he'd say, like no idea, because he. It's the type of thing that some some cues are easy to demo their melody and. Harmony and uh, it's easy to show the idea. Some things are a little bit harder, and until you actually hear it, it's really hard to get the full effect of it. So, but, but he really dug it. Yeah, he dug it. He dug it. He dug that one. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then there was other ones. <laughs> but um, no, that was a. It was. It's also, I think, you know, going back to what Marco was saying about James Mangold, is he he has um, uh, his musical courage. He has no problem looking at that and thinking, a, you know, five minute long scene, there's, it's one vibe. Whereas a lot of directors, I think, are like, oh, what about hit that, hit that, and that person falls, and blah, blah, blah. He doesn't, he wants you to, at least most of the time, he wants it to feel like one continuous vibe you're in. So like you're, you're, talk, you're talking about um, the emotions of it. Yeah, there's the, the ticking clock aspect where like it's a race against time, and then there's also this, um, this hint, especially at the beginning of like him digging into himself and stuff, um, and then there was like that whole score was like what a teaspoon of Japanese uh, <laughs> stuff. We were only allowed to use a little bit, but um, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a cool cool scene to do. So. Yeah, no. and again, you know, the, the second film set in Japan, and again, it's fairly conventional stuff. But now we get into Logan. Um, and you, you originally, uh, you weren't the first guys on it, but then you were given the, given the score, and I guess with not, respectively, a lot of time to do it. Um, and again, a very completely atypical superhero movie and superhero score. What was it like getting something just so radically different from, you know, the last film? And just I, I mean, I, I was really excited. I um Really had no idea that this was even something brewing. Or I, and I'd spoken to Jim after Wolverine. He mentioned that you know his concept for um, for Logan was he was going a different direction. That he the thing that really inspired him when he was writing it was this movie Drive, and um, that's sort of the vibe he wanted. And I was like, yeah, you know that. That sounds cool. That should that. And I was way actually recording a score in Russia. I got back and right as soon as the plane landed, when you, you know you turn on your phone, I get a call. You got to come over to Fox, and um, uh, I, I went over to the screened movie. This is just before Thanksgiving, and um, uh, I was blown away. I mean, it's really it was really good. I mean, it's basically the movie that you, that exists now. Very minor changes were made to it and um, uh, 
I thought there was a lot of room for, even though it was a very textural and minimal score in many ways, there was a lot of room for exploration. Uh, I spoke to Jim afterwards. He said the thing that he really wanted was a throwback to um, some of the scores of like the 70s that weren't maybe so polished. Um, you know, he, that, um, he said everything that bothers him now about scores and scoring is that that everything is really smooth and mixed well, and he misses that rough around the edges quality, the, the rawness, and he said, I'd, I'd love it if you just try working on some ideas, um, not to picture like I was saying before, and see what you come up with. And he gave me references. He said, I really like, um, he named a few movies that were inspiring to him. Um, uh, yeah, the Gauntlet and um, Taxi Driver and um, and Paper Moon, which doesn't have a score, but the um, the like Taxi Driver, for instance, like, if you put that score against Logan, it wouldn't it wouldn't really work. It would you know because it would it would fight a little bit, but there is an intensity about it um, that was inspiring to me and to I think all of us when we got started on this, and that was where we took off from. We had this scoring session um, at the village with just, I think, six or seven players and just wrote some ideas. I was nervous because it was really kind of wacky what we were doing, and I, you know, a few people from Fox decided to show up, and then very soon thereafter, Walked out. And, and, um, <laughs> first day, first action. What you were, you were at the board. They walk in, and one of the one of the uh, one of the music execs turns the other way. And, and, and the director's heard this. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, yeah. So they walk out. And I really thought this could very well be our last day. <laughs> but um, you know, we had a great music editor too. This guy Ted Kaplan, who. Um, would um, take our ideas and cut them in different places, even things that we were like, ah, where the, this isn't gonna, you know, it's just an idea, we're throwing it out there, but then he would cut it against picture, and it had a, a really, there was something about it that really worked, you know? Um, I think one of the first things was something that uh, Marcus did uh, called um, Local Logan, which is like, I mean, it's really kind of off the wall. Um, again, probably insp inspired by these same ideas. It's almost jazz-like intensity of uh, um, taxi driver type thing. And um, after we were like, well, that, that's fun. We had fun, but you know, what, what, what's going to happen with this? But the editor actually cut it in over a fight scene, and Jim saw it and he's like, this is this, it's great. It really works. So, um, and he also kept the studio at bay. Like, we didn't have any, normally, I mean, I've done other um, superhero movies, I've done other studio movies where you're playing back cues and you have a room full of executives. And what happens, always ends up happening, is becomes the least common denominator. Whoever has the, whatever, does, someone doesn't have a problem. If there's 11 people, someone always has a problem with something. So you're left with nothing. Uh, that people like. But here we, we were saved from that process. It was just me and Jim and Buck and Ted and we would go in and play stuff and uh, on a weekly basis and, um, and go from there. So uh, the score had a chance to be a little bit you know, and especially here, you know, some rumors about how controlling Marvel is of their, their whole musical sound and this is certainly, you know, even though I really dig their scores, this to me is certainly the most unique Marvel superhero score. We didn't, I didn't, I've never met anybody from Marvel. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I imagine that's true. Well, it's technically Fox. I mean, it's Marvel material, but it's, it's Fox. It's Fox, Fox uh, ownership of it. So we actually have something very cool for you guys. Uh, no video, no photography, but um, thanks to uh, Fox and Ray Costa and Beth Krakauer, we have uh, some footage from Logan uh, that shows the musical development of the score. And uh, Buck, I ha this is totally fresh to me. I haven't seen any of this. So I'll let you uh, kind of drive us as to what we're going to see.
Yeah, and it, what's interesting is, is that the um, idea three kind of has the, the minimalism of the second one, but played on a piano, but then it ends up in the, in the energy of the first version. So you have kind of both worlds going on there. What the, you know, what, what's interesting to me is that you know, when you have a lot of composers, how do you guys end up essentially sounding like one composer to kind of get the, so someone isn't writing something wildly different from the other person? Well, first of all, um, one of the first things we do on the project um, is figure out the palette that we're going to use, which is, besides just the orchestra, whatever the makeup of the orchestra is, it's the sounds that we're using. Like we spend a lot of time when we can um, taking uh, acoustical instruments, recording things, and then Buck spends a lot of time uh, processing things. So that we're all working within the same sound world. Like I, just from the beginning of this, you can hear there's like a there's a sound quality to the to the piano and the drums and everything, it, it, it's, uh, things weren't recorded just in a normal way, he uses like certain microphones, carbon microphones and things like that to give it a special quality, um, things are processed, we, so we all work from like the same um, setup for the most part. Um, and then, I don't know, I, look, uh, people bring different things to the table. Marcus came up with a melodic idea very early on, which um, was really cool, and so we all started incorporating it into, into the cues that we were doing. And, um, um, you can actually hear that in the uh, 1 and 6 alt. It, I mean, uh, it's called Eternum. saw the film is it's almost kind of like in two parts you have the, the kind of the western the, the lone gunslinger first half and then you have essentially the, the kind of Mad Max Thunderdome second half uh, second half where he becomes a savior and there's kind of a, a different energy uh, to the score in the film uh, Brandon why don't you talk about that uh, I had actually much more to do with the, the first part uh, so uh, and then the, the second part I was out of my league so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, um, I think Mark was right. We, we kind of spitballed a bit to see what he liked and everything. And then, um, and then based on what, what stuck, you know, like, we had tried to incorporate everything. So the, um, uh, the chunk, a lot of the stuff I did was more towards, like, the, the smelting plant s sequence. Um, so, I think Mark is kind of... Marcus kind of set the gauntlet in terms of like um, how crazy we could go, and normally Marco does that actually. Yeah, like normally Marco does something like, surely we're gonna get fired, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then, uh, and, then uh, and then they then they love it, and then in this case, I think Marcus uh, took heroin or something. But either way, <laughs> either way, the end result was 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 like like Marcus said, he, he really wanted to go that far with it, so. Um, uh, so that kind of set the it's, that kind of set the mood for the the beginning at least how crazy. So there's a lot of stuff at the beginning where I try to use some of Marcus's material, some of the thematic material from 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 Marco, and then a lot of the sounds that Buck was making, and then some like crazy piano stuff. Because he always seemed to he always seemed to like the jazz aspect of it. Um, so we kind of did some some wacky stuff with that, wacky stuff with the orchestra, and then. Uh, and that's one instance where the studio actually said, I don't know, it's going to push a little too far. So Brandon had to do this one particular cue um, a couple of different ways. One, which was a much tamer version, uh, but smartly, um, we recorded both 
for them. And after hearing both, you know, the director's like, I'm going to fight for this one, which he did, and that's what yeah. ended up in the mm-hmm. movie. So, yeah. Marcus, how was the gauntlet thrown? <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, um, as Mar- Marco mentioned before, we had a, a session in, in December at the village where we had like a very, you know, like, almost like a jazz ensemble. And um, I think the point was for you to s- sort of, you know, instead of doing mock-ups for the director, because the director really responds to like the rawness of the of live instruments, right? You wanted to sort of sell the ideas, the, the yeah. main the main title ideas, right? Right. So, and then um, we had one, that Eternum thing, which was just like this sort of, I don't know, uh, I don't know to say a throwaway idea, but it was just like a very short idea. It's just like this repeating ostinato. Um, for Laura, right? For Laura, right. So it ended up being Laura's theme or, or the relationship theme with him uh, and, and Laura. Or that's what Jim sort of wanted to, to use it for. And so, you know, we had the, we had a session with, you know, jazz musicians and I thought okay we'll just do a, a version for that for for that ensemble of that theme and because we had time I thought you know there's an, another thing that we haven't really tackled yet and that's sort of the berserker rage that he goes into yeah. it, right and I don't know it was just like this really really dumb idea to, that I wanted to try and it just he just happened to respond to it really positively <laughs> <laughs> it was really like I'm, I, I think I remember like before we recorded, I said to Marco, "Okay, so look, uh, this could go either way. I mean, maybe <laughs> you can say like after the first time, you know, just just you know, we'll move on to something else." <laughs> but it just happened to be really cool. The um, I th- worked with it afterwards. Yeah, so exactly. Like, That's because there's a little bit uncontrolled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but um, but and Buck worked with the stuff and yeah. uh, really found a place, you know, sort of dialed it in and. Yeah. Um, like no, no instrument sounded the way it usually sounds. Like the trombone, I think you just made this weird kind of thing for it. Just sounds very sort of yeah. I mean, it's 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 sort of this one-off kind of thing that turned into the you know that's something that kind of at least from a from a um, basic sound approach sort of uh, hit what he was trying to do, what Jim was trying to do. And Buck, obviously, you, you go back with Marco. You both got nominated for an Oscar for the Hurt Locker. Um, for you, what was the most challenging part of the score? Uh, uh, Logan. Oh yeah. Um, uh, I, I, it was. I mean, it, it was challenging in the sense that you know Jim's very demanding and uh, in a great way. He's got a very musical ear. But I, I mean, I, I loved it. The, it it's, it's hard to. It's hard to look back on it as a challenge. I mean, it was a time crunch, and you know, if we had an extra month, you know, who knows, you know, what, what else we could have dug up. But uh, I, I, it, it's, I'd say, time was the was was the you know the, the time crunch was the biggest challenge. But creatively, it was we had a blast. We really all loved it. I mean, for me, another cool thing about the score in the film is that you know you've got Laura uh, and you've got evil clone Wolverine, and you kind of hope that evil clone Wolverine is going to have this little moment where he, some humanity comes up, but it never does <laughs> ever. How, how? But yet you've got Laura, who humanity does come out, but who is like this kind of feral animal child, just just slicing and dicing from left to right f- through a good chunk of this film without a, quite a lot of sympathy. But how did you want to link these two characters up musically? Laura and Laura and, and, well, and uh, evil evil Wolverine. Um, I don't. I mean, uh, I don't think we ever thought about linking them. You know, it's a. Uh, you know, we, we need another month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we need another month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, Jim really wanted to sell. You know, the the actors' performances, and uh, you know, I mean, there are some pretty over the top moments musically, you know, but uh, overall I think the score is pretty subdued, especially compared to the previous Wolverine, you know. <coughs> um, so I, I don't think there was, uh, his main focus was really on Logan and Laura. That's really what he spoke about, and that the sort of paper moon father-daughter relationship. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is interesting, like, we never thought about how could Laura uh, affect 24, you know. Yeah. That's a good point, though. Yeah. 
there, there is a relationship musically between Logan and 24. I mean, based on the same theme, really, the same motive. It's not really a theme. That's the score isn't very thematic. It's more motivic, I would say. You know, I like, uh, like a few note type of thing rather than development in the traditional sense. Uh, and so they're related, but uh, Laura and 24. Uh, well, I mean, I guess technically 24 is her son. If, if she's Logan's daughter. So, we, yeah, we should have done more family stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but to the family, it's, it's actually very cool, you know, that you're all here. Because increasingly, you know, on, on Studio Tentpole Films, they're, they're, you know, composers with a team of people writing quite a bit of stuff that the composer does. <coughs> um, and, they, and some composers just take credit for that. And the, a, a lot of other people who work on the score... Uh, don't get credit, and this is not the case here. Obviously, you're all here, and it's it's awesome to have you guys here but this is together. Very, very rare. Yeah, it is rare. I mean, yeah. you know, what do you it just you know, what what do you three gentlemen think of that? You know, just in terms of how people in your position never get credit, but here you're all getting credit. For uh, yeah, I mean, the the I've been, they've kind of seen a few different versions of it all, right? They, you know, I've been done additional music in a few different scenarios, and. Um, uh, I come from a pretty stressful scenario, and the, I, like the first time I met Marco and Buck, um, I walked in and I had like my notepad ready, and I was all like, I was like, all right, let's do this. I'm, you know, I'll buy food for the week, and I'll just, you know, I'll just um, if I shower now, I should be good for a week. <laughs> and so, and I, I mean, like, I'll never forget the first time I met Marco was was uh, and, and Buck. So that, like he was talking about, you know, he had that that like bungalow in Malibu. So I walk in and. Um, and, and I'd always heard Marcus talk about them, and like, oh, they're really cool, really mellow. I'm like, I don't understand. And, um, <laughs> and so I walk in, and Marco's sitting in a chair reading a book, and Buck is just kind of clicking, something like drawing little fine things, and on probably spending a day on like one second of music. And um, so uh, they talk to me like, like, he's like, so yeah, I mean, just, you know, here's a thematic idea, and then just try what you want. And... Um, and then Mark puts his book down. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, you know, have you know, you know, when you when you have time, let us hear something. And to get that kind of creative freedom for someone you're writing with um, is I've never experienced it, and it's the best thing in the world. And and uh, and you had even told me like like Marcus had had already been with them for a couple of years and talked about how great it was and and. Um, yeah, I think I think it, it makes you want to work better for them too, and and everyone does something I think that surprises everybody else. Like Buck will do something that you just go, oh, oh my god, and then it makes you want to do something better, and then um, uh, or impossible. <laughs> it's yeah. impossible. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about. It. And um, and then but then I think I think the overall vibe is is still like cohesion of the score. Like you mentioned earlier, you want to make the whole thing sound cohesive, and somehow I think we found a happy medium. But um, I, my experience, going back to your question, is Marco's by far the most, you know, and I, I'm not saying this because you're here. I, I don't sure. I don't care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but but, uh, but seriously, I mean, he, he is like the most like genuine, relaxed, selfless person, in, you know, that I've ever worked with. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I just I'm just lucky, and uh, and then lucky to this guy for for getting me on the gate in the first place. So. Yeah, what do you, what do you think? You don't uh, like them, I know that. Yeah. But, okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can add much to that. So, I mean, the I've, I've I've been a, a Beltrami fan for a long time because I love to scream and mimic. And and the the thing is, I mean, of course, he's he's also he's a, he's you know he's someone who knows the craft. So you know, the for, when you look at his sketches, he still writes stuff out with like pencil and paper, which it's you know I I think it was like the last the last guy to, to switch from hand orchestrating to finale or whatever it was, right? So I, I really, I, I, I kind of felt, and, and I've, I love the darkness of the darkness of the music that we get to do, right? So I don't know. And then, yeah, and then obviously, personally, I mean, you know, 
This guy's all right. He's all right. <laughs> no, no, no. This is awesome. I mean, I, as I said before, it's like a family. You know, we. Uh, it's uh, when when we're doing uh, um, when we're at sessions, it's always like a blast. You know, uh, we're shooting yeah. the shit with like all the directors, and I mean, it's it's like a you know, I don't know. It's it's. You, you know what I think? Like when I started out really early on, I, um, when I first came, I, I went to some sessions. Uh, I'm not gonna name names, but uh, and I. It was like so, there was so much stress on the sessions and I'm thinking, this is horrible. You know, this is really, this job, it, it, it's, it's hard enough because you spend so much time in a dark room by yourself, you know, just looking at a picture and all that. And, uh, so, um, the idea is, you know, how can it be more fun? Well, it's more fun when there's more people involved and you have, you're working together and it's more of a collaboration. I mean, film scoring it by its nature is a collaboration. You're working with the director, you're working with other people that are giving input. Um, and to me, to extend that is, um, makes, the, makes the job that much more enjoyable. And, and when, there, when, when there is pain, which there often is, it's in, <laughs> spread, spread it around. Take it. You know, it doesn't all have to land on your shoulders. You know. Well, I'd like to turn this over to any questions uh, that you all might have. Any? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, in that one that I think was called Holmes Man. Yeah. That right, Tom. Okay. Um, how did you come up with the idea of, uh, that that you needed some motion and that that would be whatever that was, it was like a dobro banjo type thing going on in the background. Like, just watching the scene, it doesn't, it's not apparent that it needs motion necessarily, but it certainly was really a great element added. Well, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the big picture of the movie, it's a big turning point, because up until this point, uh, his, Tommy's character doesn't care who, for these women, whether they live or die or whatever, um, but at this moment, and he's leaving to abandon them, um, when they follow him, all of a sudden it becomes like something's awakened in him, and um, suddenly there's a change. So I, I, it, it, to me it was um, sort of um, a lift or something. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I have a question. Do you um, do you listen to certain tracks or classical music to use reference for for, for a scene? Like I don't know. Somebody mentioned that uh, Ligeti is a director like Ligeti that we mentioned more than it was Western. But do you ever reference some classical music or film music or rock and roll for any scene? Um, you need to put it against the picture. I not much, but. Um, and I really, I don't know. Uh, or for ideas in general. Yeah, for I mean, for ideas, yeah, it, it's um, it's hard uh, because when you're working on a picture, like it's a very delicate balance, and it's so easy to get sidetracked too. So like, if I'm working on something out here, if I hear something, I'm like, oh, that's what I should be doing, you know. So and then I'll I might get off on a on a tangent. Um, uh, and sometimes it takes you down a, a good path. I remember when I was working on um, this movie, Gaza, Egypt, there was a composer I was very, I, I thought it would be really good for. I, I, I listened to a lot, and I even referenced to these guys to check out and all, but, you know, it, it was a little too out there, I think. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of... Um, Stealing other people's ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and next question. You, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how, how do you start when you get a project? It's like um, totally blank slate. Like, how do you, how's your thought process of approaching like, a big project like Goblin or I call up Marcus and say, what do you think? <laughs> Panic. <laughs> and then, yeah. um, no, I mean, it's, uh, you're, you're right. Look, 
every picture is sort of like a puzzle that has to be solved. And um, it can take a long time to, to crack the puzzle, to come up with the elements that are basically the essence of the, the film and the score. And it takes some trial and error. And um, I, I don't know what the process is exactly. Um, you know, sometimes when you work hard at things, nothing happens. And then sometimes when you're taking a crap, it all comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Yes, sir? Yeah, I guess this is sort of the same question. But, um, you know, um, I'm always really impressed by the, the, the simple and yet deep timbres that you all bring to these scores. And you have four quarter notes. And, and Logan, you could be on one M2, I want him one version two to play on her piano, I think. And then, then um, we then you may have got four quarter notes played on the pedals of the harmonium or whatever, right? And it's like, how do you get, I mean, how do you ultimately get to that sound? I mean, does it just happen that you have a harmonium and the prepared piano to lie around? Or do you do you imagine it and find it? Or is it, uh, to unpack that? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of that's, like, Buck's always searching for ideas. The way we recorded the score was very important. The things that we recorded were important, right? And then. I mean, I think that when he says there wasn't enough time to work on the scores because he was constantly developing um, the sound of it. Like, for instance, we had, instead of using regular percussion for this, we used drum kits because we thought it would give a certain intensity, but we couldn't just use just regular drum kits because then it would sound, it would sort of take us out of the movie realm. So you know, Buck spent a lot of time making it sound, processing the drums so that it sounded... Yeah, I mean, and it, you know, if it's a director like Jim, who's, who's got a very strong idea, you know, we, we usually come in so late in the process of a film, a good director will really have a strong idea of the feeling that they want, and so it really helps. I mean, when we start really early on a project, I think it's a, it's a lot more sort of, uh, you know, just really throwing stuff against the wall uh, in uh, a greater sense. Uh, but it's it, it really... Uh, it, that really helps, and, and usually they'll tell you w what they like about the temp, you know, if there is a temp, and um, so there's it's usually some good guidance. You know, it's, it's not completely a blank universe. So, so just talk about the temp for a little bit. Like, how does that affect your process if you go in? If there's a lot of it, do you have to back out of that, or what's the negotiation of? working with temp music because everybody's throwing stuff in and it's disjointed. I'm just kind of curious how that process works. Um, we usually listen to it when we first see the movie, then turn it off uh, because it, you want to have your own take on it. And um, the thing that temp rarely is able to do is carry a uh, emotional arc through the out of the picture. It can work good for this scene or that scene, but it doesn't take you on the whole journey of the picture. So um, once in a while, if we can't figure something out or whatever, we say, well, what did they do in the tent here? How did they, how did they solve that problem? Whatever. But for the most part, I prefer, I, I think these guys too, to um, sort of you know, watch the picture once with it, see the effect, but then get rid of it. So, uh, my understanding of film scoring is that there's, it underlines what the image is of the soundtrack. But there was one particular scene, I think that is the Q lem Limonator, or something like that. Oh, yeah. Eliminator, uh, yeah, great cue. In the moment, it really struck me, like, it, I, I, my attention went to that heavy piano, you know? There. In the movie, while you're watching the movie? Well, I wasn't watching, but I thought that it was so cool because from that moment onwards, I was like, okay, I'm I'm watching something different, you know? I'm in a different trip than the usual. Yeah. So how was that decision of that putting that strong cue there, you know? Well, uh, Brandon can talk about that, but again, this was something that we talked about when early on as a conceptual thing, and then this is the cue, actually, where we had to record two versions of. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned the piano, because uh, 
I think I've become convinced that life is like a, it's super messy, and like you, you, you see the end result, right? And you think, um, you think maybe that we all sat around and said, you know what it needs. <laughs> okay, so at the recording of that, everyone liked the music except they said, like all the executives and and we got to get rid of that piano. <laughs> I mean that that's ridiculous. So we. So Marcos and Buck are like, well, let's record this thing anyway, right? So we get, so, so we, we record the guy playing this ridiculous piano thing. We probably spent, what, like, like an hour and a half making the piano sound a certain way. All, and as we're doing it, all we're thinking is they're just going to mute it. They're just going to yeah. cut it out. So then Marcos and I go to see the movie together, and we have no idea what the end result's going to be, right? So we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I just hear the single loudest piano I've ever heard in my life. I can barely hear. There's like like 65 other musicians. I, they must be this low, and all you hear is a guy going like that. On that. So, so you never know the end result. So, so in answer to your question, the piano was always in there. I have to be honest, it was supposed to be a little softer than it was. So, but in the end, um, Jim loved it. He, he, in the end, yeah. the exact opposite of what we thought would happen happened, which is everything else came down in volume, and someone said, you know what this thing needs? Piano. And, <laughs> and, and that's what happened. So, so there's no, and a lot happens at that, at that final dub, when they're finally, you know, like putting everything together, a lot of changes happen at the last minute, and that was one of them that, that was very unexpected. Uh, so it was originally intended, but just not at that volume level, but hey, you know. There's also the, um, we did an alternate take where uh, Randy Kerber was the, the pianist and uh, we had him do it on a B3 organ. And uh, it, it sounds like something would be in taking a Pelham. I mean, it's, it's the funkiest. Pelham. I, it was the I, I thing I've ever heard. It was, yeah. We had him do it twice. It, 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 it was so much fun to sit there and listen to. I should have brought that. Yeah, that, that, was, that was so good. Next time. That whole uh, limo scene, that whole scape, he basically had a B3 and he was just grooving through the whole thing and it, it turned it into like, it turned it into like 1970s Spider-Man, or like, like the only, it, it would have been the coolest scene ever. But like, that that didn't make it. Yeah. But go home and get that scene now. <laughs> Another question? Oh, I'm sure Brian. Um, this is more of a broader scope, so it's it's okay. No one really has an answer to it. But as far as like current film music trends, are there trends you find yourself fighting against, or trends that you're actually happy to see in the current performing? I, I, I never want to hear another drum in a film score. <laughs> That's, I, I, I'm so over the, the big overproduced drum thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to fight it, you know, when they ask for it. Uh, Certain things become vogue, and you hear them in all the temps. All of a sudden, everybody's using the same pieces. And, the, um, and you know, so... I guess uh, it, can, it can get a long time, but we, it, like, it's, we try not to pay that much attention to, to that. Yeah, we're, we're always looking for you know what's going to be the most, what's what's going to make us excited to, to work on something. So we'll you know explore, you know, recording outside or you know using unusual elements and trying to get the ball rolling with that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I have a question. What, is the, what does the producer do? The, the film score producer? I'm, I'm familiar with what the composer does and the administrator. Yeah, what do you do? Well, yeah, what does <laughs> it do exactly? Uh, it, it's a, because uh, you know I've been with Marco 20 years now, so it's like it's sort of hard to define what it is I do. Sometimes I write a lot. Sometimes I just work on sound. Sometimes I um, really focused on the recording aspect of it. So I. You know, yeah, like a, I'll do like pre-production of you know working with synths or whatever the sources are. Uh, so I I treat it more like the idea of what a, a record producer does, like where they'll sort of have a uh, a vision for how we can approach the, the music, you know, and the, the score. So I've seen the credit elsewhere, but I have no idea if that's if they are approaching the same way, if it's more of a sort of technical, uh, you know, logistical sort of job, or I, 
if, if I think too much about it, I'll draw myself crazy. So I just, I'll, whatever, what the hell, I don't care. You know, it's just good producer, it's fine. Luck is also our sh shoulder to cry on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shrink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 They work in the same room. Yeah. They work in the same room together. Yeah. <laughs> the overall sound of scored away sound is a little more than the buck. But, you know, in reality, these are like coast covers. Sometimes it's hard to separate the production or the, the sounds from, the, like, the creative processes involved with some of these things um, is one and the same, you know? So, uh, like a, a movie like this really is a coast score, and you know, in a perfect world, it'd be four names on the main, you know, main title. But um, you know, there's a whole bunch of politics that are involved in this thing as well. Um, so that goes beyond the creativity. Well, it's a perfect world of creature features. <laughs> and uh, um, I guess my, uh, my last question is, uh, what does Logan mean to you? Do you think, uh, for each of you, what does Logan mean to you? Do you think it's a game changer in terms of uh, tentpole superhero films and scoring? Uh, I think there's been, in the, there's been so many superhero movies coming out. And I, I think there's been um, almost like an audience backlash to the formula that has been created and it's so successful but it's like get, like anything it's a little tiring um, and the fact that Logan um, didn't follow a lot of that you know it, it yeah it's a superhero movie but it's, it's also many other movies as well inside of it um, and the fact that the score didn't have to follow any of really any of the conventions either is um, is very encouraging. I think it at its best you know, students will say oh, yeah, we don't have to make um, movies that follow any formula. We can just be creative and make, you know, a movie for its own sake. Uh, you know, obviously that's not going to happen, but um, it's that spirit which uh, I Buck, what do you think? Uh, it, it, it's, I, I certainly hope it's inspiring, you know, for studio execs and, you know, directors. Uh, I, it's, I still don't quite see it as a superhero film, you know, because it's, it's so such a strong character piece that um, it, I, I don't see how, like, you know, when they're, when they're going to work on, you know, a, a big Avengers or a Justice League kind of thing that they're going to say, oh, let's make this like an intimate character piece, you know, because it needs to be gigantic. But, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I really loved the film. You know, it's just, it was just, it was so easy to work on because you knew the whole time it was really good. So I, I think, you know, it's it's a pretty rare treat to, to think of the movie in, in such a great way where the, for me, it goes beyond the music. You know, we're usually so focused on the music, and even if we're not that into the film, we can be really into the working on the music. And on this one, you know, it was it was a nice change to really believe, you know, so strongly in the in the, in the whole the film as a whole. Marcus, uh, I mean, exactly what these guys said. I mean, I I think I, it was the first movie in a while where um, I mean, we've seen it like a uh, hundred times or something now. It's something that. Um, it's, it's it's just so, such a solid movie to start with that it just happened to be a superhero movie. Um, that, that that was something that I really uh, thought was extraordinary. I mean, um, yeah, it, I think you know when you start at that point, then you know all the stress and all the you know all that stuff that comes with working on it under such time constraints um, almost becomes secondary. I, you know. When we saw it, or when I first saw it, I, I really I was totally blown away by it, and the impact it had, and like I was thinking about it, you know, days after I watched it, and I, I thought it, you know, it, it certainly helped sort of inspire, you know, ideas, um, but it also seemed to, you know, kind of put into perspective sort of where we are, at, you know, in 
the, the seeing like, the industry as a whole because uh, um, you know comic book movies are just they seem to be just one certain thing, right? And um, I mean, it's something that I asked Jim at the sessions too because I, I was like, so how how do you how do you accomplish making the audience really care about the the characters, right? And he sort of broke down. It's like you know usually it's there's like six set, set pieces. There's like, you know, 15 characters, and at the end of the day, you have like three minutes to spend with each character to develop their character, right? Uh, through dialogue, whatever. And in this one, it's it's basically just about him and um, Laura, and, and it, it, so you know, just to have that luxury, not to have a gazillion cameos by you know other you know, and, and I think you know, in a way, that's sort of what a lot of the uh, you know the comic book, the hardcore comic book fans and Marvel fans. We're sort of criticizing on it. So it's like, oh, I wish that whatever Sabretooth would have been in it or something. And he kind of made a point. He said, this is not a movie that's supposed to sell Happy Meals. You know, it's something that's... Sad like, Meals. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, Sad <laughs> Meals. <laughs> no, that's what, he, that's, that's what he said. Like, this, it's not a movie to send, to, to sell, like, you know, action figures and Happy Meals. So, so um, which I think, you know, it, it totally... And, and yeah. It could have gone completely. It could have gone totally wrong, right? I mean, it could, it could have been a total disaster, you know. But I think the also the, the studio just had the courage after Deadpool to to make it rated R, you know, to actually really to go that to go that route, right? I think without Deadpool, it would have. You know. And I, I, as I said before, I, you know, it's a, it's a Fox movie. I, I don't think Marvel would have ever done a movie like this. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Brandon, final thought. Yeah, I mean, I agree with these guys. I, 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 I agree with you completely about the Deadpool thing. I think uh, Deadpool kind of, the timing was right. Everything was right. Like, I think I think people were a little burned out by, like, I can't watch, I, I was complaining to Marcus about breaking the rules of physics. If I see any more superheroes breaking rules of physics, I can't, I, I don't know why it bothered me so much. But, but I, I think the... Uh, there was also this, this when we first watched this feeling of like, oh wow, the uh, Hugh Jackman and, and, and obviously uh, Professor X had been like a part of our lives for what, 15 years or something? 17. 17 years. So I think there was this kind of feeling of, of wow, they really paid homage to that whole lineage. Yeah. Whether, whether it was, whether the movies were good or bad, either way, they were a part of at least us growing up a little bit. And so it was kind of neat to see it done well. So in, it kind of pushed, I think, probably all of us to be like, oh, wow, this is, this is, yeah, this is worth doing, you know, putting everything into in a, in a month. So. <laughs> uh, but, you know. Well, great job, guys. I want to give a big thanks to Zach Toe, Taylor White at Creature Features, Lakeshore Records, Beth Krakauer, Ray Costa, and Marco, Buck, Marcus, no Trump, and Brandon. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.
Thank <laughs> you.